Good morning and welcome to Wake Up and Smell the Poetry and our fifth season here in Hopkinton, Massachusetts at HCAM TV Studios. We will begin with January Gil O'Neill. January comes from Beverly. She grew up in Norfolk, Virginia and considers herself a Southern girl by heart. She got hooked on poetry in college and since then has been taking off. She has been published in a large number of journals. She has a publication titled Under Life. It's here today. She has a popular blog known as poetmom.blogspot.com and she has been featured in Poets and Writers. And when I asked January why poetry is important, very briefly she said, we come to poetry when we can't find the right words. It's the quiet moments that need our attention, having a bad day at work, folding laundry, putting a child to sleep. Those are the ordinary moments that are in reality extraordinary. Please help me welcome January Gill O'Neill. everyone. You know, one of the unexpected gifts of, of, of being a poet and being able to read my work is to come into communities and, and see the faces of the people who are reading poetry. And, and this is why I think poetry and the arts will be fine. You know, people herald the end poetry and literature, and, but no, you all are here and you all are proof that, uh, that uh, poetry will continue. So thank you for coming out this morning. I'm going to read a few poems from my book, Under Life, which came out in December. And um, I'll probably talk in between the poems. I am, well, as Cheryl, and thank you to Cheryl and to the studios. I'm a Virginia native, so I tend to write poems that remind me of home. And for those who know me, I'm a little bit of a foodie, so I think this is a good one to start the morning off with. How to make a crab cake. Start with your own hand, with your own body. The small bones of the hands moving towards the inlets of the fingers. Wanting it too much invites haste. You must love what is raw and hungered for. Think of the crab cake as the ending, as you till away at the meat, digging for errant shells and jagged edges. Always it's a matter of guesswork, but you hold it together by the simplest of ingredients, for this is how the body learns to be generous, to forgive the flaws inherited and enjoy what lies ahead. Yet you never quite know when it happens, the moment when the lumps transcend egg and breadcrumbs, the quiver of oil in a hot pan to become unworldly, the manifold of pleasure with the sweet ache of crab still bright on your tongue. So to follow up with another food poem, <laughs> one of my favorites, um, how many of you have ever had okra? Okay. In praise of okra. No one believes in you like I do. I sit you down on the table and they overlook you for fried chicken and grits, crab cakes and hush puppies, black eyed peas and succotash and sweet potatoes and watermelon. Your stringy, slippery texture reminds them of the creatures from the movie Aliens. <laughs> but I tell my friends, if they don't like you, they are cheating themselves. You were brought from Africa as seeds, hidden in the ears and hair of slaves. Nothing was wasted in our kitchens. We took the unused and the throwaways and made feasts. We taught our children how to survive adapt. So I write this poem in praise of okra and the cooks who understood how to make something out of nothing. Your fibrous skin melts in my mouth, green flecks of flavor, still tough, unbruised, part of the fabric of earth, soul food. So. 
So poetry for me is like taking uh, pictures. And a poem can represent a moment. And that's what a lot of the poems in Underlife are for me. Moments that are put on the page. And this is one of my, um, one of my moments. Early memory. I remember picking up a fistful of sand, smooth crystals like hourglass sand, and throwing it into the eyes of a boy. Johnny or Danny or Kevin, he was not important. I was five, and I knew he would cry. I remember everything about it. The sandbox in the corner of the room at Cinderella Daycare, Miss Lee, who ran over after the boy wailed for his mother, her stern look as the words, no snack, formed at her lips. My hands with their gritty half-moon fingernails I hid in the pockets of my blue and white dress. How she found them and uncurled my sandy fists. There must have been such rage in me to give such pain to another person. This afternoon, I saw a man pull a gold chain off the neck of a woman as she crossed the street. She cried out with a sound that bleached me. I walked on, unable to help, knowing that fire in childhood clenched deep in my pockets all the way home. My father is retired military and Certainly, the, we owe a great deal of, of thanks and praise to our servicemen. So this is a poem from my father. Service. The military needed cheap labor to move office furniture into the newly remodeled Pentagon. So they had the grunts do the work. My father made the 300-mile round trip for five weeks to get the job done. Sometimes he gave rides to the other enlisted and, cha and charged a small fee to those who needed a lift. My father, who in 1969 would have done anything for his wife and newborn daughter, put desks together for generals and elite brass in the oppressive summer heat in the summer of love wiping his sweaty face in the mirror of a bathroom once marked coloreds only in segregated Virginia. One day, he said, the higher ups will recognize the world is put together by men like me. Also, my mother for many years was a nurse. Uh, she worked in the neonatal unit at Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, for years and years, and um, you know, so I saw a lot of babies come and go. So this one is for my mother. Night work. After the families have visited for the evening, tethered their well wishes like balloons to the backs of chairs, taken photos of the first hours of life. My mother checks in on the preemies, often healthy, but occasionally too yellow or pink or blue. Deflated and in need of oxygen, they are held together by some order, exhausted by the urgency of being saved. For every tiny fledgling that leaves the unit, there is always another in need of touch. Gloved. My mother cared through a thin layer of separation while holding the head of a baby born smaller than a shadow. I think she liked the all-nighters, especially in early January, babies born just after the new year. She liked doing the kind things that love cannot do, adjusting another woman's breast, lifting the pillow under her head so the baby slips just above the mother's ribs, offering advice or comfort before returning to the NICU, the tectonic plates of mother and child drifting together, then apart. Often, she delighted in the midnight coos, a love song for the phantom ache of babies she could never carry. Those tiny loaves, quick, unleavened, so eager to take touch like communion, while she loved what remained, 
leaving her impoverished soul open and gaping. She shuffled through our house as if it had long antiseptic corridors, there but not there. Such is the life of one in service to others, under no illusions about the gift of grace. My mother, whose voice is the sound of love becoming, seldom wondered what became of those raindrops whose first days of life were x-rayed, poked, prodded, their sentences commuted to time served. Yet they never, they will not remember this time when they were barely more than zygotes, as it should be, as if they were never there. So one of the interesting things about this poem, which you can't see, but uh, in the book, uh, it's an ABC poem. So it's 26 lines long and uh, goes from A to Z. And I even managed to get my name in the poem. <laughs> so, so. Mm. Uh, I don't have too many poems of place, but this is one of them. This is a poem uh, from my childhood back in off of Virginia. Lightning bugs. What are they made of that they can frolic and sparkle above the delicious scent of honeysuckle on a warm June night? They'll shine for anyone to make the world a little less dull. And where do they come from? They glide golden against the moon's patina, drifting above Big Debbie's backyard and Junior's corner market. I sit on the front stoop, watch them float across well-worn streets, the blacktop of my misspent youth. My cupped hands I offer only to put them in a jar. They cannot tell me about captivity or what it means to love and to set something free. Still, like a true captor, I detain my bugs until morning, now grateful for release. To understand malice, I would deny them the right to shimmer. The Ripe Time. Each month, she thinks her nipples are becoming more tender. Areolas blooming into wild ginger. Before her is a bed filled with ardor. Pregnant, not pregnant. She is the princess without the pea, a ball stuck in the pinball machine that tilts like clockwork. After making love, they lie on their sides, silvered with sweat. She listens for the soft chirp of her own breathing. It does not reveal why her body operates like a failed business. On this night, where marriage is the only safe place she can go, her husband holds her, tells her it's just a matter of time. But all she can think about is the empty house they can't afford and the ripe tomatoes growing in backyard containers, smooth, fleshed, and heavy, falling from their stems. So I am the mother of two kids. Alex, my son, is seven, and Ella, my daughter, is five, and they keep me busy, as you can imagine. So when I told them I was coming out with a book, they were like, yeah, okay, great, poetry, okay. You know, let's, let's, let's turn on SpongeBob. But then I told them that I had poems about them in the book, and they actually saw me read these poems, and they're like, oh, mom, that's cool. Can you read this one? Can you read that one? So when I read, I tend to read a few about each child, so, you know. And uh, I just came back from the Dodge Poetry Festival, which is in, uh, this year was in Newark. And I picked up a poetry book for children, and they have really gotten into it. So if I could just put in a plug that if you have children or grandchildren or your aunts and uncles, poetry is a great gift for kids. And hopefully if we get them to read poetry very young, they won't have the aversion that a lot of adults tend to have. But a poem for my for my baby. Poem for my infant son. That first night, I made your father sleep with the lights on so I could make sure you were still breathing. Your brown body so malleable, one false move could break you forever. You are all feet and inches, 
cooing a song I've never heard in a language I don't understand. Yet you have taught us in your own way, loved us even when we try, fail, fail again. That's what children do. Baby boy, my lamb, my suckling, my colt. You look at me like I am your whole world, but the truth is, you are mine. And one for my daughter. So when my daughter was three, she went through this phase where she was eating crayons. <laughs> She's five now and is out of that phase, but it makes for great poetry. So the title of this poem is called The Kerning. And the kerning is a publishing term, uh, an old term, and it refers to the spacing between letters. And for me, it kind of represents the spacing between family members. Sometimes we're together, sometimes we're apart, we're not on the same page all the time. So this is for Ella. The kerning. Today I spent the morning brushing pink crayon from your teeth. This tells me you know how to eat words. You've tasted those intangible calories that fill my cavernous heart. You're beginning to understand how sloppy and brutal the imagination can be. I put my hands between your pearly teeth and yank petals of paper from your mouth. Someday I will teach you how to read words that are not there, show you how to breathe without disturbing the air. Nothing lives outside of us in this overprinted world. Decide for yourself. Then let me know if you can eat a crayon without leaving a mark. Okay. And another one for Ella. I don't have too many form poems in this book, but I wrote a villanelle. And uh, this is really based on a dream. Tangerines. Seems like yesterday you were in my dream, formed inside my body as a pearl. Last night, I nibbled your feet like tangerines. Those plump sections with meaty toes in between, pebbly skin, your thin rind, a dizzying whirl. Seems like yesterday, you were in my dream. Your hands hold tight to a crumbled saltine. What you cherish most, I try to unfurl. Last night, I nibbled your feet like tangerines. I think about your soft fruit, still pristine, before your hair tilts up in a sexy curl. Seems like yesterday you were in my dream. I'll wake from this and replay the scene, the moment you say your life is yours, let it unfurl. Last night, I nibbled your feet like tangerines. You'll grow up, grow older, my little bean to tell me you just can't help being a girl. Seems like yesterday you were in my dream. Last night I nibbled your feet like tangerines. And I think I may have two or three more. I hope I'm okay on time. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> All right. I, I, I see a few coworkers in the office, so this one's for them. The editor speaks. Uh, and I guess I should mention that I'm an editor uh, and writer uh, as a, for a living, so this might only be funny to us. I don't know. The editor speaks. There is a flow among the elements on a page word, buttressing word, lines asleep on a feather bed of 80 pound stock. After all, the newsletter you're reading is an ecosystem for language. And there you are preening and sorting someone else's natural selection. Your hands part the cool water of the page surface, splashing letters in your face. Every voluptuous character, every minuscule glyph, rolling down your cheek as beautiful as tears. Yet all that negative space bends to the wind's slightest rustle, keeping the kerning in sync with the letting, the tracking aligned with meaning. 
Everything gives off a vibration. Just listen to the call out box and what it calls. Helvetica opens its beak to Galliard, while the seraphs bloom their impossible hues. They fling themselves against the synapses of the brain until something frilled and pithy is born. Something elemental, but not original. The trick is not to care about any of that. You hold your red pen like a torch, and you run through as you run through a forest of thickly settled text, only looking back to see what branches you have burned. Mm. Okay, and two more. Always there's something. Every house hides a story. Ask it about the grout, the knots in the hardwood floor, the dirty secrets we share between the sink and the sponge. Days press down on me like an iron on a silk blouse. First, there are the insufficient wants, stockpiles of clothes and toys, movie stubs from 1986, pictures of people I loved once. And then there is this need to ask for help, to be impoverished. I talk to the closet, tell the clothes my story. They send their regrets. Say, don't dust anything taller than your tallest friend. <laughs> Always there's something wanting to be something else. A cake, a glass cake dome becomes a tabletop garden. A hothouse for baby tears is a blessed moment of escape. And I will close with one for my son. Saying yes. If you find yourself awake and alone at 4.30 in the morning, you wait until you hear that first bump against the wall, the shifting of sheets, the bounce of bed springs. You wait for the first toy to be kicked and some obnoxiously loud children's song to disturb the air, and the shuffle of footed pajamas on hardwood floor to follow. You've waited for this moment all night, maybe all your life, when that ghostly half figure enters your darkened room, nothing visible but his outline before your box of a voice finds its first words of the day, you wait until your son tugs on your arm and says, Mommy, all you have to do is say yes. Thank you. Sorting through the remains. After he died, we gathered to sort out his life, his children and I. Those densely red rows of clinical books, darkly carved masks from Africa, print of a moonlit river flowing through Japan. Hardest of all was the closet where his clothes still hung, that slate blue suit with the double English vent tailored to fit a rounded form, his white terry cloth robe, a short-sleeved shirt from Greece banded in blue and white for walking along the beach. I snapped his picture once swaddled in that shirt, puffing on a mini cigar, gripping a horseshoe crab by its tail so I could savor its prehistoric form. His children helped me sort, though mostly I stayed away while his former wife made piles of all those clothes she'd never helped him choose. It was much simpler so. Except that I kept a patchwork tie crisscrossed in blues and reds and yellows. For two long years, it hung from a hook at the back of my closet door a talisman to touch each night before I went to bed. 
I got to know you better. I got to know you better. The chase that catch them no longer. I found you so dependable. You stay to mind so playful. I learned about your anatomy and some of your physiology. I even know your dentistry. I really like your postal infused metal crown or no maxillary left central incisor. <laughs> White water lofting is over. We float on gentle water. We slap a paddle together, our love on little river. I got to eat to better, the dating made me fatter. Your favorite food is pizza, here I go way to watch her. White water lofting is over, we float on gentle water. We slap a paddle together, our love on little river. White water lofting it over, we float on gentle water. We slap a paddle together, our love on little river. Our love on little river.